Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this panel that I'm very honored of being part of. So the paper that I'm going to present today is entitled Rebel Governance During COVID-19, Describing and Explaining Armed Groups' Responses to the Pandemic in the Middle East. So uh, as COVID over the past uh, two years has been uh, spreading worldwide, not only governments but also armed groups, and especially those armed groups that control territories and the population living in those territories, have inevitably been called to address this crisis. However, uh, still very little is known when it comes to how these armed groups have been uh, dealing with the crisis. And this was before I, <laughs> I, I went through the presentation of Theoban. So, um, and this lack of knowledge actually inserts in, uh, itself into a broader gap because in the literature on rebel governance, uh, despite we know uh, a lot, thanks to the work of many of the people here in this uh, room also, about how armed groups have been providing governance, there is a kind of a gap when it comes to how external shocks that are not related to the conflict dynamics in which these armed groups uh, are part of. Um, we do not know exactly how, thank you so much, how um, these external shocks affect the um, kind of decisions, the preferences and the strategic choices that armed groups make as providers of governance. And in fact, over the past two years, while we've been uh, uh, reading a lot of studies about uh, states and governments' responses to COVID-19, we have a comparatively uh, less deep knowledge when it comes to armed groups' responses. So uh, my research aims in this paper were uh, to first describe the different uh, responses that different armed groups have been providing to address COVID-19, uh, looking specifically at the Middle Eastern region that over the past decade has been a, a laboratory of rebel governance. And the uh, second step, proceed to explain why armed groups have uh, responded to the pandemic as they have. And from this point of view, uh, COVID was mm, an opportunity to um, really look at how different groups respond to the same emergency. Because previous studies could only look at how uh, groups in a specific context were dealing with the uh, emergencies occurring in that specific uh, uh, geographical context. For instance, a tsunami or famines. While COVID really gave us a, a, the opportunity of adopting a global uh, approach and outlook. So uh, this is uh, the academic relevance uh, that I believe this study uh, has, but it also has a more practical relevance and uh, I became increasingly aware of this working for the past year as consultant on Syria and Yemen for an NGO that is trying to bring humanitarian aid in areas under the control of armed groups. Because understanding how uh, violent non-state actors address the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, potentially other emergencies can uh, inform our approaches to dealing with violent non-state actors and approaches to intervene more uh, successfully and uh, with realistic approaches and strategies to provide humanitarian assistance to the civilians that live in these territories under the control of uh, armed groups outside the control of governments. So uh, when it comes to the descriptive uh, side of my work, I built this um, very simple but I hope clear uh, COVID-19 governance response continuum that goes from um, null to extensive. By null, I refer to a situation in which the armed group takes no action to address the crisis, for instance, denying the presence of the virus in its uh, territories, or engages in disinformation, for instance, conspiracy theories. Uh, minimal response means that uh, the armed group engages in preventive measures, for instance, uh, instructing the population on how to behave to prevent the spread of the virus, but nothing more than this. Intermediate means that uh, besides engaging in these preventive measures, the armed group also engaged in proactive joint measures. Joint, for instance, cooperating with uh, foreign governments or humanitarian organizations to distribute vaccines, to make an example. While uh, on the other end of the continuum, we have extensive responses. That means that not only we have preventive measures, uh, proactive joint measures, but also proactive independent measures. So the armed group has the willingness and the capacity to uh, engage in proactive responses independently, for instance, uh, providing uh, training to the medical personnel. While uh, proceeding to uh, the uh, explanatory effort of my work, referring to the literature on uh, rebel governance and armed groups' behavior, 
I identified four factors that might help us to uh, identify the reasons why some groups might be on one point along the continuum and others on another point. So ultimate goals, I um, assume that secessionist and ethno-nationalist armed groups are more likely to engage in emergency governance because um, they need to prove their uh, governance credibility in the case of secessionist groups to the international community, in the case of ethno-nationalist group to the specific ethno-nationalist constituency that they are uh, aspiring to represent and to govern upon. While uh, non-secessionist and non-ethno-nationalist armed groups uh, are less likely to invest in emergency governance because they are more um, free from this need of proving their governan uh, governance credentials in the eyes of the international community, excuse me, or uh, internal domestic constituency. Financial resources, so I assume that armed groups who depend on civilians to access financial resources, for instance, through taxations, are more uh, likely incentivized in times of emergency to provide governance because they need the population to be alive, first of all, uh, healthy and economically productive. While uh, armed groups that are not dependent on the civilian population to access financial resources, for instance, because they have the support of uh, an external patron, will uh, uh, have a less incentive to invest in emergency governance because their uh, financial survival is not dependent on the well-being of the population. Thirdly, uh, conflict in intensity. So armed groups engaged in high-intensity conflicts, I assume, are, uh, are likely to divert resources from the military battlefront where their priorities are towards governance, even in times of emergency, while armed groups engaged in low-intensity conflicts are more likely to engage in emergency governance because they, have, uh, they can allow themselves to redirect resources from the military effort to the governance effort, especially in times of crisis. Uh, governance experience, finally, armed groups with poor governance experience, especially in the specific field that is affected by the external shock, in this case, health governance, are um, likely to lack the capacity to offer a governance response to the emergency. While uh, armed groups that have uh, significant governance experience, or at least intermediate, have the know-how, the manpower, um, the facilities to address the crisis. I, uh, to conduct my study, I looked into Hayatari Rasham in northwest Syria, Hamas in Gaza, and the Houthis or Ansar Allah in uh, Yemen. I selected them because they are engaged in some form of at least minimal governance. They, from my preliminary reading um, of the data, I saw that they engage in different responses to COVID-19 and they display some differences with respect to these uh, explanatory factors that we were just uh, looking at. And to collect my data, I looked at the materials that the armed groups themselves uh, published that are videos, images, uh, newsletters, reports and that are available uh, online and that are in uh, Arabic mostly, but also in English. And then secondary literature, so journalistic rep articles and reports by humanitarian organizations on the ground. Uh, I will not go deep into the case studies, but for instance, uh, it's interesting to see how Hayat al Sham from the very beginning uh, instructed civilians on how to behave, for instance, wash hands, it cooperated with the humanitarian organizations to bring vaccines into uh, northwest Syria and uh, introductive systematic medical checks on people coming from uh, Turkey to northwest uh, Syria. The Houthis, on the other hand, engaged in a disinformation campaign from the early days. They accused uh, the United States and Israel of uh, having fabricated uh, the virus purposely. They intimidated journalists, preventing them from spreading information. And they uh, even recruited uh, youth, saying that the only way for them not to mm, contract the virus was to fight uh, alongside the Houthis. While uh, Hamas um, engaged in an extensive response, as we will see, because it closed public places, it enforced a general lockdown in Gaza, it prohibited large gatherings and open quarantine centers and provided um, training to medical personnel in Gaza. So going back to the continuum that we saw before, I called the Houthis are uh, providing a null governance response to COVID. Hayat uh, al an intermediate response, possibly leaning uh, towards extensive, and uh, uh, Hamas is providing an extensive response. And uh, proceeding to see which of the factors that we discussed before can really help us in uh, illuminating this picture better, 
I find that armed groups that depend on international recognition to reach uh, their ultimate goal, and uh, this is the case of Hamas and Hayat Arir al-Sham, have an interest and incentive in providing governance in times of emergency. While a group such as the Houthi that is uh, uninterested in international recognition uh, thanks to its military upper hand in the war in Yemen is uh, not incentivized to provide this kind of emergency governance and invest resources even in times of emergency. Secondly, uh, armed groups that depend on civilians to access financial resources such as Hamas and uh, Hayat Arir al-Sham that mm, derive most of their finances from uh, the taxation of the population are incentivized in investing uh, in governance in times of emergency. While the Houthis, a group such as the Houthis that uh, derives its financial resources from other means, for instance, uh, expropriations or diversion of humanitarian aid and sold on the black market, um, does not have the same incentive to uh, invest in emergency governance. Uh, when it comes to the uh, conflict intensity, um, I find that armed groups engaged in low-intensity conflict, such as uh, Hamas, seem prone to invest resources. However, what was my expectation when it comes to um, high-intensity conflict um, was not confirmed, because um, in the case of Hayat Arir al-Sham, the group is engaged in a high-intensity conflict against the Syrian regime and the Russian uh, allies, but nonetheless, it uh, found it convenient in its interest to invest some of its uh, resources in uh, governance during the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, armed groups with a poor governance experience, and this is the case of the Houthis, uh, do not seem uh, capable of engaging in extensive governance responses in times of crisis, while armed groups with some degree of governance experience, such as uh, Hayat Arir al-Sham and even more so Hamas, have a greater capacity when it comes to facilities and personal and know-how to address the emergency. And here I put uh, these um, observations in this table that uh, I hope can be the beginning for having a clearer picture than we have uh, now of how armed groups behave when a sudden emergency comes and they uh, are left to deal with it. So I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion.